Okay, we have come to the last of our week 8 lecture. So if the first lecture has looked specifically at courtly rituals and ceremonies and performances, and our second lecture has zoomed in and used uh, the Kelantanese Wayang Kulit as a case study. For our final part, we're going to look at popular forms of amusements, performances, and rituals that takes place within the context of uh, the common people. So these are more rakyat-centered uh, forms of cultural expression, the most significant of which is really a type of uh, get-together where everybody eats together. In Javanese culture, this is called the slamatan, um, which is really, uh, you know, a kind of like blessing or bestowing of uh, safety and, and well-being uh, on those who are present. Uh, it is also described in other contexts, such as the work of anthropologist Halim Haji Saleh as a type of fisting circle. Uh, and really, what the fish feasting circle is, is that while it may seem uh, very egalitarian and, you know, everyone is sitting in an equal role, uh, you're just sharing from the same plate, uh, but it is also a very intricate choreography of mutual obligations imposed on those who attend, those who help out, the place it is chosen for it to be held, whose house that was chosen for it to be held, who was doing the hosting, uh, then as well as who gets to deliver the oratorical address of prayer, and not forgetting the often unacknowledged women of the household and their neighboring friends who are expected uh, and invisible in this photo, but expected to do all the cooking, serving, and cleaning up. Uh, that makes up really a hierarchy of kampung as really a, one of the most basic unit of sociality. Uh, so manifesting itself as a fisting circle, therefore, gives us a sense of the various kinds of structure, the, the structure that's in place within a kampung. So in Halim Haji's uh, study of a, a Kelantanese kampung in the 1970s, uh, he would actually typify this kind of like social hierarchy within the kampung environment according to diminishing uh, one's possession of a diminishing amount of daulat. And, and here he equates daulat to this concept of semangat. And while in, uh, in uh, Malay uh, monarchical discourse, Daulat tends to be defined as that sacred power that is the birthright of kings or sultans, right? And really what this means is that one's right to rule over others, one right to become a raja, is because one possesses Daulat. It's a different way of, in some ways, saying that one possesses a high degree of semangat. Uh, but Halim Haji Hasale takes a different view uh, in which she interprets Daulat along as, as something more pervasive. Uh, and this is almost like a, described as a trickle down effect, whereby at the top you have the Sultan possessing, uh, you know, the most Daulat, uh, followed by, you know, other aristocrats. Uh, such as those who hold titles uh, before you reach the commoners. And then there are also those who are uh, less desirable uh, in society. Uh, in this way, uh, uh, Daulat therefore has a lot of parallel to this Indian uh, Indic concept of caste uh, that was previously much more strongly entrenched because of Hindu, Buddhist, uh, a sort of discourse of power uh, that became uh, central to how political power was framed in the first 1,000 years uh, of the common era in Southeast Asia as a result of Southeast Asia participating within 
the larger Sanskrit cosmopolis uh, network. Therefore, uh, let's not forget also the, the slave class as well. Uh, in many ways, therefore, uh, trying to describe society as a binary between you know, the Raja and the Rakyat, or the Bangsawan and the Rakyat, is not exactly accurate uh, in the sense that it's a very graded hierarchy with different nuances embedded within this spectrum of obligation, of prerogatives, of privileges and priorities, and also deferences. Uh, built into this is also an expectation of how you behave. And really, it's, uh, on the one hand, there is some level of judgment uh, encoded in, within how we evaluate these behavior. So as a Bangsawan or someone who is a king, you're expected to speak in Bahasa Istana, which is uh, recognized as a more refined Malay. And you are expected to conduct yourself in a way that uh, exudes or projects uh, Kamulia An. So Kamulia An, uh, with the uh, with the uh, suffix uh, Ke An there, really then transform the word Mulia or gracefulness into exuding a state of gracefulness. Uh, that also means that you have to behave properly, that you have to carry yourself, and uh, you have to sort of like show comportment in the way you conduct yourself, and. As villagers, therefore, uh, you're not expected to exhibit such traits because you're not within a hierarchy where such traits need to be performed. As a result, interestingly, you're expected to do the opposite, uh, to demonstrate qualities and traits that are not mulia or graceful, uh, such as uh, engage or indulge in pastimes such as cockfights or bullfights, uh, where there's a lot there was heavy gambling going on besides the sporting spectacle of two animals trying to you know uh, uh, fight each other to death and this is a pastime that was very much part of Southeast Asia if there was any form of sporting obsession uh, in the pre-modern period or the early modern period it has to be either cock fighting or bull fighting and whether you're in mainland Southeast Asia or Southeast Asia, it's the same. And again, uh, just to at least emphasize this point, uh, that uh, even with pastimes such as this, it's not merely uh, sports as we understand them to be. Uh, like, you know, uh, the manuscript illustration of the uh, bullfighting uh, shows uh, this is a 19th century manuscript and within it you will be able to find uh, illustrations showing uh, uh, how you can tame the bulls using specific mantras and spell and therefore uh, an entire set of cultural beliefs in which there are many different observances and there are also practices that would allow you to intervene spiritually towards obtaining an outcome that is in your favor. So in um, like what you have seen uh, uh, in the previous lecture, you know, uh, the, the kind of arena in which uh, perform, the performing arts are uh, performed in a kampung environment really is made up of a kind of hastily assembled demarcated area where the performance can take place and the audience can come and uh, watch and participate in the event right uh, so typically in uh, wayang production uh, so unlike the court wayang in java where it's played out in the pandopo which is like a wait uh, a, a pavilion built to receive guests uh, in the house of a noble person or or, or the or the sultan uh, in the kampung, uh, you know, a wayang performance uh, takes place. The pangong itself is in the form of a, uh, a raised dais. But in other types of dances and ritual dramas that, are, uh, that existed in, uh, uh, amongst the common people, uh, many of these ritual dramas are enacted within a compound 
that is called a bangsao or a kandang. Uh, so a kandang today survives as a term that refers to a kind of shed where you keep animals, whereas bangsao tends to uh, mean roughly a, a workshop or something. So in a sense that you know these, uh, the meaning that have survived do give you a hint of how we can think about the bangsal or the kanda in which performances used to take place. So uh, very much like the bangong at the right yard level, it would be hastily, it would be sort of like assembled using quite perishable material, such as this example from 18th century that shows a, a, a toping dance that's taking place in a village. It's a much more rustic quality to the environment and also um, in terms of the audience uh, and performer uh, proximity, you see that it's not as clearly delineated or established as, for example, uh, uh, illustration that you saw previously on the Wayang performance in a Javanese court. Here, uh, people tend to sit very close to one another and the space tends to sort of like, uh, the performing space and the uh, spectator space tends to sort of like blend into one another, often requiring the spectator to participate, uh, contributing to the liveliness of the performance. Um, so one of the purpose, uh, one of the better known uh, types of permainan uh, at a folk level, it's called mind uh, or you know, it's a short form for mind putri, or what is called playing princess in the English language. It translates very awkwardly, uh, and uh, doesn't really give you a sense also of what it is about. Uh, essentially, what it is is a kind of psychodrama, where you have a, a person uh, playing the role of the tok mindo. And he is seen as an intermediary for the sick people to converse with the Tok Putri, uh, uh, who then it, uh, represents as, uh, the spirit, the spirits, uh, or the or, or the spiritual beings that are uh, the cause of the patient's uh, problem. Typically, uh, patients who suffer from you know psychological sort of like ailments. Uh, would use this as a way to engage the community uh, and get the community to recognize their ailment and in doing so uh, compels the community to participate in the, a collective healing process because uh, you know a, a, psych, a psychologically ill person in many ways has introduced a kind of like disruption to the normative rhythm of a society, and as such, therefore, the healing doesn't need, does cannot only take place on an individual level. It needs to take place on a social level together with the community as well. And these two characters, the Tok Mindo, I mean, Do and the Tok Putri, uh, therefore plays a crucial role as almost like uh, a lawyer, right? They are both advocates. Uh, so Tok Mindo, on behalf of the, his client, the patient, and Toputri on behalf of the spirit. Uh, and they would then go into this drama where different uh, jinns would be possessing the spirit, uh, the body of the Toputri, uh, whereby Tokmindo would then constantly address uh, uh, the Toputri and trying to figure out who is the spirit that is in the body then. And is that the spirit that was causing uh, the ailment? Uh, and if so, then uh, once recognized, uh, there would be almost like an enactment of a kind of struggle uh, through which uh, uh, the victory of uh, Tomindo would result in not only the healing of uh, the patient, but also the healing of the community and how this is expressed it is true with the invitation at the end of the ceremony where everyone would participate and join uh, you know, the performers uh, in a dance and there would be a communal dancing uh, so that the entire experience 
is a form of what is called a mind barubat. That it is play, but it is a healing type of play, a play that is medicinal in nature. Uh, so thinking about um, uh, healing this way, thinking about art as really an aesthetic process to help us to work through conflict, conflict that exists internally within an individual that causes psychological stress or conflict within society engendered or resulted from a person being afflicted by very individual personal psychological ailment. We also see in the process there's a very very different concept of what mental health is and how to approach and engage with mental health uh, or concepts of well-being and these are not sort of like uh, founded in uh, the discourse of psychiatry or even uh, uh, psychology that we are familiar with. Mm, nevertheless, I hope you'll recognize how much they are really psychological methods to help a society work through certain issues that really connects what is essentially very personal with the social and the social with the personal and don't see them as necessarily divorced like how we would approach a, a mentally ill patient in today's context through the lens of psychology. Uh, so finally, let's uh, look at another way in which mind playfully registers itself. And this takes, uh, in the Iban context, mind is often connected to this concept of Bajalai, so Bajalai is kind of like the Iban equivalent of the Minangkabau notion of Marantau. So if the Minangkabau men are expected as they come of age to travel the world, to see the world and gain new knowledge, bringing back the knowledge to their uh, homeland and contribute to uh, the growth of uh, Minangkabau society, so is this idea of Jalai in the Iban context where you're supposed to undergo a journey and this journey is thought of as not only physical but a spiritual one and mind plays a role in which there is a spiritual dimension where you are expected to also assume different forms you take on different forms as you descend into uh, different realms or the uh, in order to obtain a new knowledge uh, that will help you grow as a person and turn you from a boy into a man. Uh, of course, this is a highly gender uh, specific uh, type of rite of passage. Uh, so there are criticisms against uh, this idea of Bajalai uh, from a gendered perspective, uh, but I don't have time to go into it. What I want to highlight is how mind then therefore plays a very central role in uh, uh, the Iban notion of obtaining knowledge as well, right? Uh, you need to shape shift yourself and, and, and take on new forms so that you're able to obtain new sort of like knowledge. And this is part of a process in which uh, you bajalai to discover your own story. But a very unique form of mind then emerged amongst the Ibans uh, belonging to the Betong district. Uh, so, uh, and this is called the Sugi Sakit ritual, uh, where it's unfortunately no longer practiced uh, and, you know, has died out since the 80s. Uh, so, uh, one of the last uh, priest bard or storyteller uh, himself uh, explained that the mind in this context is really to enact a drama. It is also to tell a story to Bacharita. So, what does it entail then? Uh, it's very interesting because, you know, the serious work of uh, the, this story occurred at really the beginning and the end of the narrative. And, and the middle episodes were primarily told for entertainment purposes. So with the opening of the story, uh, what the priest Bart tries to recreate is a parallel uh, predicament between uh, the, 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 the problem in the story itself and the situation uh, of the that the client is facing. Uh, typically, uh, 
a person who asks for this story to be told is really, you know, uh, uh, must be uh, often very ill or, you know, almost dying. Uh, so when that happens, uh, it is assumed that the person is almost, uh, you know, being forgotten. There's an absence of visibility. People try to sort of like hide their fear of death by, you know, especially within a close, close community by ignoring uh, the person or, uh, or, or not recognizing that the person is around. And, you know, as such, you know, when you have a person that is ill, that is dying in a long house where people live in such close proximity, it is also a space where the long house as a community itself uh, undergoes a period where it is it, being sapped of its energy. It is unable to attract visitors. No newcomers want to come in because there's a dead person in there. You know, the beetle nuts uh, are not harvested. No one's cooking. You know, the, the cooked rice are spoiled because no one to f there's no visitors to feed or entertain. And uh, if people are dying, then maybe there are also not enough young men around uh, to court young women and, and make the house fertile and uh, productive, right? Uh, so to rectify the situation in the story, uh, you know, the leader of the, uh, uh, of the longhouse uh, calls his wife, uh, the mother of Rimbu, uh, she calls out to all the young women of the longhouse and gathers them to create a love charm. And these love charms are called Pemandang. They embody the power of Pandang. Really what it means that is visibility, you're able to see uh, here. So this is important because it's very fitting uh, translation of their power to attract, right? Uh, call one's attention to certain things. So the story really is of the main hero, Su, uh, who is portrayed as a miraculous healer. He doesn't come from the Kampo. He's from outside world. Uh, and he has this mirac uh, miraculous ability to bring back life of even enemies that he has decapitated in the battle. So because, you know, the Pemandang spell is released, he was enchanted and attracted to the village, whereupon he met a maiden, Sedinam. Uh, uh, so um, in a way, they then are epitome or they are exemplary of masculine and feminine beauty, right? Uh, so in meeting, they fall in love and they are very perfection. They are the very ideals that they represent uh, as masculine strength and feminine beauty is recognized in the Sugi story as a source of healing power. Like the love charm, they embody the pemandang, the power of visibility. Hence, to behold them is to be drawn uh, to them. Uh, so the effect of the Sugi story was then really to call out to the listener who is actually uh, very ill in real life, uh, to re reawaken the listener's attachment to the living world and the physical pleasures that made life in this world worth living. So in a very dramatic and vivid way in which it was performed uh, and, and conveyed to the listener to feel or experience uh, this love, this asai rindu, uh, directly as an emotional response to what they're hearing and seeing. So for the patient, what the Sugi story does is that it opened his awareness to an imaginary world beyond pain, fear, or other frailties of the body, while at the same time it restored his connections with the past, evoking memories of youth, of courtship, and love affairs. And with a possible future free of pain and bodily infirmities. So what it does is that it brought about an emotional transformation both in the patient and the social community that assembled to take part of it. So from an initial state of worrying or grieving, a community through the story was mobilized, motivated by feeling of compassion, uh, also spirited by this, uh, who doesn't like a love story, and organized into ritualized occasions of visiting, hospitality, and feasting. It's a way to kickstart a community again as well, to remind them of what is life worth living for, 
the patient too was in this sense transformed, uh, you know, brought into the ritual as an aging and often gravely ill patient about to die, about to give up. He or she became, if for only one brief moment, uh, through the identification with the heroes and heroines of the Sugi story, he is now a young man or a woman in the prime of their life, a victorious warrior and a maiden to be caught. So what is interesting is that's this characteristic of uh, characteristic feature of the stranger king myth again that is uh, uh, that is embedded within the sugi story in the way that the transformation that the stranger brings uh, is someone the stranger is someone who is foreign to the society he visits but must be in some ways be captured by the host of the society typically this capture comes through a sexual union uh, and in the Sugi story, as a result, the hero enters uh, the longhouse and begins to sort of like court the beauty of the longhouse. Uh, and in this marvelous, uh, you know, uh, fairy tale romance story, what happens is that there are two outcomes that can happen. The first is that the patient, the very ill patient, is so stimulated and so encouraged by the story uh, that he finds or he or she finds the will to live again and therefore recover from his sickness um, and as a result then the cure works so the other possible outcome is simply that the person dies um, that's the reality but even if he or she dies he or she dies uh, with a story but it's not just any story it's a it's a love story. Uh, it's a love story that brings the patient and restores in him for one brief moment and a capacity to imagine a different state of, of mind, an experience of being in love again uh, that makes living meaningful. On top of that, you get a pretty great send-off uh, by a community who now acknowledges you and is there to participate in your death and celebrate your life at the same time. So in, in closing our discussion on what Mayan is today, um, we have seen how Mayan can be not just playful in the sense that it allows us to take on, uh, assume different forms and roles. In, oh, it is a kind of creative resource that speaks of um, how you choose to engage with whatever sources and materials that you have uh, in front of you and shaping it into a story that is worth telling. Uh, so uh, when we think of these performative uh, dimensions of a culture that we have explored, whether in you know, courtly types of performances and ceremonies to, you know, folk uh, forms of amusement. What is uh, crucial to remember is that in thinking about mind, uh, it is never about trying to locate what is authentic or what is original. And I think this best sounds it all when we see this illustration of a Malay Wayan performing a Chinese opera style play in Siboga. Uh, you know, uh, in and of itself, culture should not only be taught in dynamic terms, but and we think of cultures as playful ways in which people engage with uh, materials that they come across and fashion those materials into stories that give them, give meaning to their life. Then I think we're getting closer to an understanding of what is power in the Southeast Asia context as not only a kind of like uh, force that is imposed from top down that subjugates, that, uh, that is violent, but also something that can be skillfully manipulated and channeled uh, and harnessed to shape uh, uh, very imaginative kind of realities that could make uh, our lives